And let us now continue to hear this imagery in our next reading from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, and then continuing 10 through 16. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit. There is just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. He who descended is the same as the one who ascended far above the heavens so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness, and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth and building itself up in love. This is the word of God for the people of God. Twice a year, three of my friends and I would find ourselves wandering around in the endless forest of backwoods, South Carolina. Don't tell Lewis, but not every corner of that great state is bustling and full of life. There are areas that are a bit more deserted. So not indicated on any map and overlooked for the other 363 days of the year, this small slice of overgrown wilderness became a lively community of tents, cars, and people, once in the spring and once in the fall. We were drawn here to this place because it was here that the biannual Ultimate Marine Corps Mud Run was held. Several charities put this together, and this 10-mile course traversed through woods, through pits of mud that came up to our necks, and through 36 team-based obstacles, which you couldn't do alone, all the while keeping a clock running. Now, run in teams of four, this race, unlike anything I've ever experienced, made me rely on the strengths and gifts of my teammates and friends because I could do nothing alone. In fact, you couldn't finish the race unless you crossed the finish line with all of your teammates together at once. There were 15-foot-high walls you'd have to lift each other over. There were ropes you would pass back and forth slogging through the mud. And this all led up to the final the final challenge, the definitive show of support for one another, the 100-yard fireman's carry. We're digging from the very pits of our exhaustion in the finish line in our sights. We would drape one of our friends over our shoulders and run that last 100 yards to the end, where then we would collapse and congratulate one another for the finish. This race taught my friends and I a new understanding of trust for one another, a new understanding for valuing each other's gifts in relation to our own. Whether it was the strength to pull one another over a wall, the speed to run the next mile, or the moral support to pull my energy out of exhaustion, I truly could not have run this race without my friends. We kept a stubbornly consistent attitude that we were going to stay together no matter what. For although we were four members individually, 
we were one team, one body that worked in unison. Now, every year, the obstacles would change. They would put them in different orders. They would create new challenges out of some craziness that try and challenge us to take on a new thing. And of course, the weather would change as well, year to year, day to day, hour to hour, we would face unbearable heat or torrents of downpouring rain. And this would cause us to reform our approach to the course. It would do us no good to stay with strategies of the past, and it would be of no value to change our approach, to rethink things simply because we wanted to be different. We would use our past experiences as a foundation, and then we would adapt. Each new approach for a reason that we thought would help us achieve our common goal of finishing the race together. Now, as much as I wish I could tell you that we improved every year, getting better and better, this was sadly not the truth. As we continued to reform, we often hit stumbling blocks, discovering that our ideas were not always as great as we thought they were. Over the years, we experienced broken bones, bumps, and bruises. I myself carry several scars and a uh, concussion as well to remind myself of Mudrun's past. But that is the challenge of reforming. That is the risk of adapting to new obstacles which you don't know, which you've never experienced. You're not sure how they'll come out, but you continue to learn as you grow. Now, the church itself carries several scars and pains from its history of reformed thought as it sought to meet new obstacles encountered in this ever-changing world. Wars have been fought and communities have been driven away from the church. We have never been perfect, for discerning the will of God in our lives is a difficult task. But we are reformed and always reforming. We find our roots in Scripture and our guidance in the Holy Spirit as we seek new understandings to face ever new challenges, carrying our cuts and bruises and learning from them as we continue on. For while we are disciples of Christ with our minds on the heavenly kingdom, we are also human beings grounded in a world that is desperately seeking compassion and unity. We aspire to uphold the words of Paul from our scripture this morning. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God who is above all, through all, and in all. We are reformed and always reforming through God's grace and love. Now, I know when I hear the word reformation, it often conjures Im images of ancient bearded men standing in great Gothic cathedrals arguing over the holiness of sacraments or disgruntled theologians nailing 99 theses to church doors. And yes, these sisters and brothers of our past have laid a sturdy foundation for our growing faith as they sought to return the church to what they believed was a corrupt state back to a more authentic faith grounded in scripture and living according to God's word. But reformed does not have to just be restricted to the text of history. The church is reformed and always reforming because it is composed of you and me. It's composed of those who will gather here later today and those who will gather at other places of worship today. Just as God is not distant and remote, but creative and active in our lives, the church is not just a static building of stone and wood meant to adhere to these original doctrines. Instead, it is a living and breathing dynamic body of Christ, ever changing according to the creative word of God. Now, an essential belief in our Reformed faith is that this cloud of witnesses, this understanding that we are bonded with our neighbors both today and those who have come before us in the Holy Spirit. The only, one, the only way we continue to be reformed and always reforming is through God who has blessed us each individually, this whole cloud of witnesses with unique gifts, 
which are vitally important to the whole. Some are apostles, some are teachers, some are prophets, some build homes with habitat for humanity, some provide food to those in need with our food pantry. We rely upon one another for God made us to be in fellowship with one another as one body in Christ in which no one is unneeded and no one is unloved. When my friends and I were running, it didn't matter if I could run the fastest or jump the highest because I knew they were there to support me when I fell short. And I knew this without fail because when one team, when one body works together in unison, there is a deep trust and a truth and love for one another which allows a continued movement forwards toward a shared common goal. And this too is where the body of Christ that we are all a part of finds its hope and courage to always be reforming in order to meet new obstacles, new challenges in this world. We share in the centrality of God who is above all, through all, and in all as we seek to journey hand in hand towards our common goal of building the body of Christ and growing into love with one another. We continue to reform because God's calling continues to guide us in ever new directions, seeking to proclaim peace and love in this world. We are reformed and always reforming. The Presbyterian Church has a constitution that governs us and it's composed of two parts the Book of Order and the Book of Confessions. Now, if you ever need any assurance that we are, in fact, reformed and always reforming, look no further than these two rich documents. The Book of Confessions, in particular, is a veritable timeline of how the body of Christ in our tradition has sought our calling of God's Word in our lives, building the body of Christ in love and growing into discipleship composed of 12 confessions written from different cultures and time periods, including the all-familiar Apostles' Creed, which we have affirmed together and affirm every Sunday, we trace this journey that we still continue on. We can see the most recent addition in the Belhar Confession, a beautiful document written in the early 1980s by the Dutch Reform Mission Church in South Africa which witnessed to unity, reconciliation, and justice in the midst of an oppressive and unjust apartheid system. The letter that accompanies this confession in our book of confessions, written after its adoption by the United Reformed Church in Southern Africa, states, we are deeply conscious that moments of such seriousness can arise in the life of the church that it may feel the need to confess its faith anew in the light of specific situations. We are aware that the only authority for such a confession and the only grounds on which it may be made are the Holy Scriptures as God's holy word. So you see, we continue to confess our faith anew, addressing our ever-changing culture, speaking truth in love to this world, as we continue to reform. Before the 222nd General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church held last year, this confession was not included, but we are always reforming. Second Presbyterian Church, in fact, as a member of the Whitewater Valley Presbytery, not only had representation at this General Assembly gathering, but also was represented at the Presbytery meeting where votes were taken for the inclusion of this confession. We are part of this reforming body. And I cannot think of a more clear way to exemplify this compassion and peace of the body of Christ in this confession. Our book of confession states that the Belhar is is given as a gift to the whole global reformed family and the belief that the themes of unity, reconciliation, and justice issue a call from God to the whole church towards holy action transformation, and life towards our common goal of building up the body of Christ in love. God blessed this community with gifts of peace and grace and love in a way which many others cannot claim. I, for one, know I could never write something of this scope, but we need not worry 
about our lack of these gifts, for we all benefit and are greatly supported by this community's confession, for we are strengthened in their gifts. In the fallibility of this world, a new obstacle arose to meet the church, and God called us to find our groundedness in Scripture and to address this mistreatment and division of our brothers and sisters in a new way not previously done. We learn from our past, taking the foundations of those who have come before us, supported by the cloud of witnesses, and we were formed, continuing to confess our faith anew as God called. The world will never cease changing, thus we will never cease reforming, as new obstacles continue to arise and compelling us to seek God's calling and to build up the body of Christ in love. The source of our consistency and comfort in all of this is the eternal presence of God who is above all, through all, and in all things. We continue to strive for unity with one another in humility, gentleness, peace, and love with this knowledge that God is at the center of all things. Therefore, no matter how the body of Christ change, no matter what obstacles rise to meet us, God will always be the common thread, binding us together as we reach out to one another and speak truth and love while seeking our common goal, our common calling to build up the body of Christ in love and to grow into our Savior, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen.